Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful that we are able to listen to your word. We ask that the Holy Spirit will be our guide. We pray that you remove any distractions, any worries, and we pray that each of us will hear the message that you have prepared especially for us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Regardless of what people mark down on a religious survey about their beliefs or lack of belief, I believe that all of us worship. We are all hardwired for worship. If you don't consider yourself a Christian, then you might balk at such a suggestion. But worship is not just a religious impulse. I think at a subterranean level, deep within each of us, we worship. Religious people worship, and you are sitting in a worship service. But whether you are undecided, totally against, or not sure, I believe every single person worships. We have something in our life that we make ultimate. We put on a pedestal and it governs our life. We make sacrifices and every one of us give our life to something or to someone beside ourselves. Some of you may say, well, I have nothing outside of myself that I give worship to. And that's fine. So you are the center of the universe. And you are your own God. The novelist David Foster Wallace made a piercing observation in a uh, speech he gave for a high school or college graduation. He said... Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. And David Foster Wallace is not a religious man, but he made this incredible observation. Every single person worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. J.B. Phillips a uh, Bible translator in the 50s, speaking in the same vein as uh, Foster Wallace, said this. He wrote a book in 1952 with the title called, Your God is Too Small. <laughs> Philip says, the trouble with many people today is they have not found a God big enough for modern needs. And he was right. And if Phillips was writing today, I'm paraphrasing what I think he might have said. Phillips may have said something like this. Well, in fact, he said this. The challenge for many people today is finding a God who is big enough to embrace the world, so big enough to embrace the world, and yet close enough to fulfill the inner emptiness. Many of us have a God who is too small. And even those of us who attend church may have substituted a God who is puny and punitive for a great and gracious God. And we wonder how we have got to the stage where God has been minimized. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, of Jacob, of Isaac. The God revealed in Jesus Christ, who gave the ultimate sacrifice, has been minimized into a small and distant God. 
the substitute God that many have today is tame and narrow, limited, boring, unable to surprise you, unable to go beyond our perceptions of what God is. A God that is, in essence, just boxed in. And we are able to carry him safely around and dictate what this God should do. A God that we have essentially created in our own image. And this God that is stingy with mercy. This God that has only enough love for the right type of people. The right type of race, the right type of uh, political association, the right type of denomination, the right type of upbringing. This God can be boxed in and told who he can bless and who he can be a part of. Our God is unable to restore and to redeem or to transform anyone or anything. And this faraway God isn't the bread of life for hungry lives, like the Bible says. But this faraway God is more like uh, an agricultural report telling us that wheat production is good. Distant, far, and not involved in our life. And when we feel overwhelmed by change and threatened by emptiness, this distant God cannot help us. I was reading something this week uh, by a sociologist named Daniel Yanklevich, and he makes a really interesting observation. He says that we are living in times, and I think you'd agree, that are changing. And he wrote this in the 70s, actually. He says that society, it is on shifting tectonic plates, you know, like what is underneath the earth. You know, we've spoken about in Seattle, the big one is probably coming sometime. Make sure you're ready, you know? So you have plates that run underneath the earth, and when they shift, they cause destruction and movement. And Daniel Yanklevich says that this society and this culture is on shifting plates, and life is changing and moving, and we are unsure about what to do. We are facing shifts that include economic changes. A few years ago, we had the subprime mortgage lending crash of 2008, and just this week, you may have woke up on Tuesday, or was it Monday, and heard Wall Street in a complete panic because the Chinese stock market was looking volatile. And so we have economic shifts and changes. We have uh, huge corporations downtown who have op-eds written about them in the New York Times about how they treat their workers. We have people wondering what is going to happen Downtown, you have people that serve us food, that give us services, and they are unable to live in King County and have to bus in an hour, an hour and a half, just to get to work. We have shifts of economic change. We have worldview changes. Seattle, of course, is known as one of the most progressive cities in the country. Where Seattle goes, the rest of the country follows. And every day we rub shoulders with people who think differently to us, who disagree with our worldview, who don't see life in the same way. We have technological changes. We are living in an age where you can wake up and be on the grid for 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You know the question, what would you take on a desert island if you could take three things? 
I think in today's society, one of those three things would be a really good Wi-Fi connection. Because you know, if you, if there, as soon as I get to a building, I am asking for the Wi-Fi code. So we live in an on and never off society. You know, you have to check your inbox for your Facebook messages. You need to check your tweets. You need to see who Snapchatted you. You need to check the vines on Vine. You need to check the streams on Periscope. You need to see what's going on on Tinder. We are never, ever switched off. And in fact, if we were going to give uh, changing society a theme, it may be a line of a song which says, turn down for, don't pretend you don't know. <laughs> we are never off. And many of our relationships are a mile long and an inch deep. And before you accuse me of being uh, a Luddite who wants to go in a cave, light a candle, get rid of Wi-Fi, just you know, have a loom and weave my own clothes, I use all of these things, but it's, it's making sure that you are using them and they are not using you. And while we are trying to cope with the technological, financial, and worldview changes, we also have to cope with the immediate and personal changes in our life. I've spoken to some of you, and you are dealing with illness. You are dealing with families that have gone awry. You are dealing with challenges at work and at college and with your colleague at your workplace. And the limitations of aging, bodies and the inevitable transitions brought on by the passing of time. And when we go through these changes, a small God, a distant God, cannot help us. A God that can be boxed in and commanded and made to dance to the tune of our whims cannot help us. An impersonal force somewhere in the universe cannot help us. And if that's all we have, we are on very thin ice. Work grinds, our energy is long, needs pile in, but we are at risk of caving in. Opportunities come, but we're divided. Our schedule is jammed full, but we're empty. And maybe things may not, may not be this low for you, but maybe they have been in the past. Emotionally near bankruptcy, over the limit and maxed out, a small and distant God cannot help us. What's the good news? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays an incredible prayer for a community of people in Ephesians. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul, beginning in verse 14, begins an incredible revelation about who God is, about how big God is, how magnificent and gracious and caring and loving the God that we serve is. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are going through the book of Ephesians, and we're halfway through. Ephesians was written by a man named Paul who followed Jesus Christ, wrote this book around AD 60 to a group of churches, and scholars think that the Ephesians, the Ephesus church, because it was the largest, had its name added to this letter. Originally, it was just to a group of people. And so Paul, writing this letter from a Roman jail, pens these words, and it makes no sense to write this kind of prayer in jail. Who knows what dim, dripping, wet corner he finds, what cobwebs he has to sweep away, what little critters he has to shoo to get on his knees and pray for 
the church. And Paul says in Ephesians 3 verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are entering into a prayer. And I don't know about you, but when I was young, sometimes uh, if I woke up really early, you know, you want a cup of water, you need to use the bathroom. Sometimes I would go past my dad praying. You know, you hear him praying and you're like, wow, I did not know that I was the cause of such deep groaning. <laughs> you know, and, and so you're faintly embarrassed as you hear your parents praying and interceding to God on your behalf. But you also realize that your parents hold you as a sacred trust as someone who is precious and worthy of the time to be up at four in the morning praying for you. And we know that many of us would not be here had it not been for the prayers of a faithful mother or a faithful father. And so Paul here, a faithful apostle, prays for his church. And he wants us to hear this prayer. And this prayer has been encouraging to communities for generations. So Paul begins and he starts praying to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to that power that works within us to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful prayer. And Paul prays this for a new community, a community that is only a generation removed from Jesus Christ, a community facing persecution, a community trying to forge an identity, and Paul in a prison does not think about himself, but thinks about this community and prays for them. And one thing you realize about this prayer when you read carefully is that it's littered for all you English majors out there with second plural person pronouns, a.k.a. you. You know, you write the word you, but it's not singular, that one, you. And so Paul here is preaching and praying and lifting up a community of believers. And he is telling them that in experiencing fellowship with God, the church is important. The church is important when it comes to experiencing fellowship and knowing who God is. Christians are blessed with each other, and Christians are stuck with each other. We're just like a family. People may get on your very last nerve. Some people may have actually gone to an interview that you didn't know about, gone through the first and the second round, and then got a job and been promoted to a full-time position of getting on your last nerve. And yet God tells us, and Paul tells us, as he uses these plurals in his prayer, that we, as a church are necessary to reveal God. 
Read verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 3. It says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known through by the who? By the church. To the principalities and powers in heavenly places. The church at his best, is the brightest revelation of God's love. The church is supposed to be a stage where in our interaction with each other, in the way we treat one another, in the way we bless each other, in the way we confront each other with love, reveal the love of God. And we know we know that does not always happen. <laughs> Some of us have been on the receiving end, and we know that the church is not always perfect. Is it ever perfect? The church is messy, and yet Paul decides that somehow, through the revelation and the wisdom of God made known through the church, people will understand God better. The content of Paul's prayer is structured around three clauses in verse 16, 18, and 19. And an easy way to read this, because when I was reading this, even though I'm familiar with this passage, it can get a little confusing. Paul seems to ask for things that have already happened and give you things that I thought I already got when I was a Christian, you know, be filled with God and with Christ. You're like, wait, in Colossians you said that when we receive Christ, we're filled with him. So it's, it gets a little confusing. But there are three clauses that he uses to, to put this message together, 16, 18, 19. And an easy way to see it is that they are rungs on a ladder. And so with each petition to God, Paul takes a step up on the ladder and becomes bold in what he asks God for. He asks God that we might be filled with Christ. He asks God that we might be strengthened with the Holy Spirit. He asks God that we might know the love of Christ, and he asks God that we might be filled with him. And Paul asks God big things, because he knows he does not serve a small God. And Paul asks God many things because he knows he doesn't serve a distant God who doesn't care. And Paul boldly asked all of these things. And one thing you notice is that Paul, <laughs> Paul has some interesting things to ask God. Everything that Paul asks God is really like dense theological stuff. Paul doesn't say, and Lord, please forgive all the student loans of the suffering students in the church in Ephesus. God, wipe the mortgage clean of every elder and deacon in Ephesus. God, for the husbands, give them the ability to say yes and to smile and to willingly tell their wives they are beautiful every morning when they ask, how does this look? Paul doesn't say, God, help me to get that promotion at work that I want. You know what Paul says in verse 16? The very first thing he says. He says that he wants the church to be strengthened with the might of the Spirit of God through the inner man. Paul, why are you asking that? Why is it so important? to have our inner person strengthened. <laughs> and I believe the reason Paul says this is that if we have Christ and the Spirit inside of us, everything else is taken care of. If your inner man is strong, but your world is crumbling, you can step out in life with confidence. But if your outer person is fantastic, you've maxed out your 401k, you've been promoted every year straight, but your inner man is weak, you will approach life 
and you will feel totally bereft of confidence and of any kind of satisfaction about what is happening. And that is why Paul starts off with what is inside before he says anything about what is outside. A few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to see what it looks like when your inner man is filled with your spirit and how you respond. In Charleston, those tragic shooting of that church group in prayer meeting, in cold blood, by this young, troubled man trying to start a race war. And these people, when they had the opportunity to come face to face with their killer, what did they do? <laughs> they forgave him. They extended the forgiveness of Christ and they even invited him to receive the salvation of Jesus because their inner man was strengthened and filled with the Spirit. And so their outer man, though the world was crumbling, though their loved ones had gone, though life did not seem like it was worth living, they were able to look that man in the eye and forgive him, each and every one of them, and extend the gift of salvation. And what does it look like when the outer man is strong, but the inner man is weak? We found out with the shootings in Virginia, this troubled TV anchor who was dismissed. When he writes this tirade, he says, oh, I've been angry. It's just been bubbling up in me. And I've been like a bomb waiting to explode. And yet, the man is not living in poverty. The man has career opportunities. But his inner man is crumbling. He's, he's unable to forgive the slights that he think were given against him by his previous employees. He's unable to let go of the fact that sometimes in life things don't always go the way we want. And it just built in him, built in him, until he went and shot two of his former colleagues in cold blood. When the inner man is strong, the outer man can step into life with confidence. And when the outer man is strong but the inner man is weak, everything crumbles. And Paul, on his knees, prays for the church that we might be strengthened in our inner beings. To put it in one sentence, we may say that the fruit of our heart bears witness to the root of our, of our affection. The fruits of our heart bear witness to the root of our affection. If what is in our heart is rooted in our self and not in Christ, if what is at the root of our heart is rooted in anything else other than the all-sufficiency of Christ, then when trouble comes, we have a very, very thin reservoir. But when we are rooted in Christ, we are able to glimpse the dimensions of God's love. And Paul tells us that he wants us to be able to comprehend with all the saints the love of God. A love that is so long that it reaches into our histories. And with our permission, forgive us, forgives us even of our worst mistakes. <laughs> a love that is so high that no lid can be put on it and so deep that it reached out to us when we were in the gutter and pulled us out. A love that is so strong that it did not see the riches of heaven as something to be coveted, but came down in flesh, dwelt amongst us, lived in Section 8 housing, and died on a Roman tree for our sins. A love that leaves us breathless with astonishment. A love that shines with dazzling glory into our hearts 
and every corner of the universe. This God, the God of Paul, the God of the Bible, is neither distant nor small. And I pray that today, as we have read and soaked ourselves in this incredible, generous, lavish, luxurious love of God, that we might believe that God is for us and not against us. And I pray that this week, Volunteer Park, I will and you will accept Paul's prayer and believe and experience God's surrounding, encompassing, and holding love. May you meet the God who fills you when you are empty. May you meet the God who makes you strong when you are weak. May you meet the God who makes you and keeps you rooted and grounded when everything around you is shaking and you don't know up from down. And may you be surprised when in the week to come, this God gives you more abundantly than you can even think, ask, or imagine. With all the saints, amen.